Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, blessed be the name of the Lord. Father, we just give you honor and glory in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this wonderful opportunity to study your holy word. Give us wisdom. Give us insight and revelation in the knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, may the word of the Lord transform lives tonight. Change us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that whatever has been lost, Lord, that you restore to your people. For the Bible says in Psalm 69, you restored what you did not take away. You restored to us what you did not take away. What the enemy stole, you restored to us. So I pray for restoration in the name of Jesus Christ. He said to David, you shall recover all. You are not partial. So I pray that people recover what they have, what's been stolen from them. Recover what has been missing in their lives in Jesus' name. I pray for salvation, for healing, for deliverance. I pray for blessings, Lord, that make rich to which you add no sorrow. Empower your people, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. And where the enemy has occupied any life, any territory, in anyone's life, tonight I pray in Jesus' name that the enemy be dislodged, expelled, cast out, that he be removed from that place. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Praise God, praise God. This is the second part of our study on uh, giving the devil no place, you know, giving the devil no place. I'm going to uh, teach more on how the devil had a place or actually Lucifer had a place and how he lost it. And so that explains why he's looking for a place. Makes sense, right? You know, we're told and we studied this last week uh, in, in Ephesians 4 and verse 27 says, give the devil no place. Excuse me. Give the devil no place. So that actually means that Satan is looking for a place. He's, he wants to uh, take some territory, capture something that's not his. And we're told not to give him any place. The, the Greek word for place, P-L-A, P-L-A-C-E, in English, the Greek word in the New Testament for place is the word topos, T-O-P-O-S. And as you can tell, uh, topography, you know, area, um, ground. So give the devil no ground, give the devil no foothold, no territory. Amen. In your spirit, in your soul, in your body your finances, your family, your marriage, your relationships. I mean, just period. Give him no place in your life. Amen. All right? But we're going to see in the Bible, I mean, this is, once you see it, you're going to say, okay, now it makes sense to me. I don't agree, but it makes sense to me as to why the enemy is so keen on taking a place because he's lost his place. See, he's lost his place. He had a place, and he lost it. So let's look at it from the Bible. All right, it's going to help you guard your life, guard uh, what God has given to you uh, with vigilance. You know, uh, you're going to be a lot more alert, if you would. Be a lot more alert. Be a lot more vigilant after this study. So, let's turn to, actually, the first time man was told to protect or guard what he had been given. Genesis. Genesis 2. And verse 15. So, I want to go to... Genesis chapter 2, and verse 15. 
And uh, this is the first time God's talking to man. God's talking to Adam. But as you know, all mankind was represented in Adam. So Genesis 2, 15. And the Lord God took the man, the man Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it. So we have dress it and to keep it. So notice man had two duties, two main responsibilities here. This is Genesis 2 verse 15. God put Adam in the Garden of Eden in paradise, there was no sin, no problem. Yet God told him, dress the garden. Uh, that means to cultivate the garden. You know, preserve it, watch over it. Uh, well, tend to it. Tend to it. Be a farmer, that is. And then he says, to keep it. To keep the garden. So, this is the first time we see right at the beginning of, of man's life in the Garden of Eden at a time of uh, beauty, innocence, perfection, no sin, no problem. God still says to Adam, take care of the garden, tend to it, cultivate it, and... The second thing God says, and keep it. Keep it, K-E-E-P, keep it in English, keep. Now, the Hebrew, the Old Testament was first written in Hebrew. The Hebrew word for keep here, keep, is the word shamar, shamar. It's S-H-A-M-A-R, S-H-A-M-A-R. And it means to guard, to hedge about, and to protect. To guard, to hedge, put a hedge around something, a fence, a protection. So God told Adam to guard the garden. Now, what, what is that suggest to you if somebody says put a hedge of protection around your life around your garden you know put a fence wall around your plot your your land fence it in I mean what that's telling you something that's telling you especially for Adam being in paradise no sin, no evil. There's no one else around. It's just Adam and God. There's no human being around. I mean, think about it. W wouldn't you wonder, okay, God, what's going on here? Now, obviously, Adam, uh, Adam's spirit is in direct contact with God's spirit. So Adam clearly understood that there was an enemy of God and an enemy of man, an enemy of Adam. And also that that enemy would like to enter Adam's domain. That enemy, the devil, would like to enter Adam's garden. Now, of course, we're not told here that there's no name given to this enemy. But you all see that it's, it's clear that Adam knew that there was an enemy. This is the first time on record there is a reference to an enemy outside of Adam's life, outside of Adam's house, Adam's garden, Adam's marriage, Adam's family outside of the human race. And he's being told, this enemy would like to come in. 
just give you something quickly that you and I can just relate to. It, it, we, you know, I'm, I'm in America right now. In America, there is a problem, problem with racism. There are some people who are racist. They hate other people who, who don't look like them. Now, these people who are racist were not born racist. Children don't know that. But they are taught it, you see. So at some point, this negative energy, this evil, wrong information entered them. It entered them. The Bible tells us, Google it, find it. The Bible tells us that the devil entered Judas, Judas Iscariot. There was a time the devil was not inside Judas, but the devil entered Judas Iscariot. The same way the devil possessed the serpent and came to deceive Eve in the Garden of Eden, the devil entered Judas Iscariot. Before the Great Tribulation starts, and there's a one world government and one person ruling almost the whole world, before that starts, the person who will rule the whole world, according to the Bible, is called the Antichrist. The Antichrist. The devil will give his power to the Antichrist, the devil will possess the Antichrist. So According to scripture, in the history of the human race, there are only three times that Satan enters uh, God's creation as in humans or an animal. To deceive Eve and tempt Adam and Eve and cause Adam to transgress, go against God's law, the devil entered or possessed the serpent to betray Jesus and have him crucified. The devil entered Judas Iscariot and caused him to betray Jesus to get almost the whole world following him to take the mark of the beast on their forehead or on their right hand and follow the Antichrist and reject God eternally. Just make a decision that makes them reject God eternally. Satan will possess the Antichrist. So apart from these three cases in Scripture, it is not written anywhere in the Bible that the devil possesses any human being. So regardless of how uh, hard anybody makes your life uh, on earth, that person does not have the devil in them, no. Uh, they may have uh, an evil spirit. They may have uh, a wrong spirit, but like a demon uh, possessing them, or oppressing them, but they certainly don't have the devil in them. <laughs> Although one may feel like, man, this guy just has the devil in them. Uh, it, it's not so. It's, it's not so. Satan, in fact, yes, uh, oppresses people, influences people, but the devil himself does not enter people. Uh, and it's too restrictive for the devil. You know, he just wants to be free to, to cause a whole lot of havoc all over and to be restricted in one person or just one creature. It's just too limiting for the devil. So the devil doesn't just go around possessing people. Uh, the only three times the devil did that, you can see that it was world-changing. It just, it was an event a possession that changed the entire world. Possessed the serpent, changed the entire world. Man fell into sin. Possessed Judas Iscariot to betray his Lord. Uh, and the devil thought that in crucifying Jesus, 
that would be the end. He did not know that in crucifying Jesus, we would be delivered. Amen. So we thank God. And then, of course, the third case is when uh, the Antichrist rules the world. And the people who follow him, uh, follow him because of uh, this just a satanic spirit that he has uh, to mesmerize them, to blind them, deceive them, you know, so and so forth. All right. So you have seen, if you're just joining us, Genesis 2, verse 15. God tells Adam, tend to the garden, cultivate the garden. So by the way, Anybody who doesn't work, you don't want to work at all, ever in your life. Uh, I have news for you. Sorry to bust your bubble. God wants you to work. <laughs> Amen. God wants you to work. Even in paradise, Adam, excuse me. Even in paradise, Adam was supposed to, to work. Now, when you're working with God, it's a joy. And also, uh, you work efficiently. You work by the wisdom of God. So, uh, it's not like work that we know of today. Because you know that it was only after Adam sinned against God that God said, uh, it would be by the sweat of his brow that he would eat. So from that time, it made work onerous. It just burdensome. But in paradise, Adam was working before sin. And it was, it was beautiful. It was pleasant. So God can give you work that you enjoy. I pray, in fact, I pray for you that God will give you, open doors for you and give you you know, work that you enjoy. And, and work that you enjoy is just really where you're using your talents, your God-given talents, your God-given gifts to do that. So it's not really work. You know, it's just a joy. It's something that you could do for free. But the beauty of God is this. When you use the talents, the gifts he gave you to do work, it's easy for you. It's enjoyable. But because you are anointed to do it, if you would, because you're gifted to do it, it's, it's not burdensome. And that anointing, that God part of it, makes you excel. And so that excellence, that gifting opens doors for you and just brings you before great people because you just become great. Uh, and so you are the, the return that you get from it, the remuneration that you get from it is also great. Amen. So we are designed by God to work with the gift that God gave us, the anointing, the equipment that you have from God and you to excel, and that excellence will pay you back greatly, amen, to take care of you, you know, yourself, your family, and for you to have to give to those who don't have, amen. In, in fact, in Ephesians 4, we are told that a person who did not work, let him work, uh, so that God will bless the works of his hands, and he'll have more than enough to give to those who don't have. So we really are supposed to work. Amen. I would like to be on a beach somewhere, you know, just watch the ocean every day. That's me personally. That's what I enjoy. But I also enjoy what I'm called to do. It's fun. It's fun to just share and teach God's word. Amen. All right. So God bless you. Don't lose your dream. Just believe that God will give you open doors, divine connections, and the grace on your life 
will make room for you and you make an impact in your generation. Amen. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Excuse me. Isaiah chapter 14. Thank you, Lord. And we'll look at verse 12. For those of you who are not driving but were taking notes, it's verse 12 to verse 17. Verse 12 to verse 17. Sometimes we're not able to cover all the verses, uh, but at least you have the reference. So, Isaiah 14, verse 12. And we'll begin to look at how the devil had a place and lost that place. All right. Isaiah 14. Verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? So there is a being who fell from heaven. It says you are fallen from heaven. Let's get that. There is a being who fell from heaven. We're given a name for this being here. The being here is called Lucifer. So Lucifer fell from heaven. Quickly, let's support this with Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. And I'm coming back to Isaiah. Luke 10, 18. This is Jesus speaking. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Amen. Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So, we see clearly that Satan fell from heaven. At the time Jesus was speaking, it had already happened. So this is not a reference to when Jesus defeated the devil on the cross, nor is it a future event. This was a past event. Jesus was saying here in Luke 10, 18, this is something that already happened. He said, I beheld, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Amen. So this is a reference to uh, a time before Adam was created. Why? When Adam was created and God put him in the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam, guard the garden, fence it, protect it, defend it. Amen. It's yours. And you have the right to keep the enemy out. So there was an enemy of God and God knew that this enemy would like to come into man's life. But God gave man the authority to keep the devil out. So it wasn't God who allowed the devil to come into man's life. It was man. It was man. It's, it's, it was Adam who allowed the devil to come into his life. The people today, some people who say, well, I can't believe in God who's allowing all this evil to happen on earth. But it isn't God doing the evil. People are doing evil against people. When people lynch other people, that's not God. That's people doing that. So we have to put the blame where it belongs. That's just people being evil. It's not God. We're not robots. We have a free will. And when we use our free will against ourselves, for example, you're taking opioids or 
You're taking something that you know intelligently, you know this will destroy my body, and you keep doing it. I mean, that's not God's fault. It's it's your fault. You know, and you, you're not some weakling. You're not some simpleton. You're just there. And whatever comes to mind, you just do it. You have no control. No, 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 no. We have control. We have the power to say no. You and I know when we like something, we go after it. When we don't like something, we know how to put it away. We know this. This much I know. When somebody likes something, they go for it. When somebody doesn't like something, they stay away from it. It's, it's just as simple as that. So we can't turn around and blame God. No. Man could have kept, Adam could have kept the devil out of our lives. And man, we will not be having all these problems we have today. There will be no ISIS. There will be no bombings. There will be no craziness. There will be no racism or anything like that. But Adam sinned. And some of, and sin came to all of us. And death, which is spiritual separation from God, passed upon all men from Adam. Passed to all men from Adam. So we have all sinned because our first father sinned, all right? So that's the universal sin. But apart from that, apart from the universal sin that Adam committed, that has passed upon all men, like David said, I'm born and shapen in sin. See, that's that trait, that human trait of sin that came from Adam. We all have it till we come to Christ and are born again. Apart from that, though, we have all sinned. You committed your sin. I committed my sin. We thought sin. I thought sin. We did sin. We spoke sin. But God forgave us. So there are some things that we cannot blame Adam for. You get it? There's some things that we made our own choices. Granted, I agree that we were able to sin because Adam allowed sin to come into our human life. But the New Testament tells us that Death reigned from Adam on man up to when Jesus came because of the law. The law makes your sin more sinful. Then it says, even those who have not sinned after the manner of the sin of Adam, they are also sinners and they've all been concluded under sin. Do you get it? That's a little bit theology to just say that every human being has sinned because of Adam's sin. So even if you have never sinned, because of Adam's sin, you, you are a sinner. Do you get it? Okay, apart from that, you have sinned before, <laughs> you know, because to err is human. To sin is human. So you have sinned before. Sin of thought, sin in action, sins of omission. You omit to do something that's right. Or sin of commission. Sometimes you even see some injustice against someone and because you are afraid for your own life, you don't speak against. Let's take America, for example. Why do we have racism? Because the people who have the power, they are wimps. They are wimps. The people who have the power to stop it, most of them are wimps. Why? They are selfish. They, when they see the evil going on, they have the power to stop it. They have the power to confront the others who have been racist, but they don't do it. Why don't they do it? Because they're thinking about their skin themselves. Selfishness, that's one. It's sin. Then number two, they are wimps. They are wimps. Because if you had the moral courage, you will stand and say, no. You get it. And it will stop. Amen. But it's not stopping. See, I'm from heaven, so I think differently about these things. I live in the word. I'm born again. I'm a child of the living God. And I have the nature of God. My authority comes from heaven. My life comes from heaven. So I'm not under the spirit of racism. Praise God. Romans 8.15 says that God has set me free from the spirit of slavery because he has adopted me into his kingdom as his, as his son. So nobody has power over me. That's what I know from God's word. Amen. Now the rest of the people say in America, I'm, I'm talking about where I live. And there is a lot of prejudice. There's a lot of racism here. And I'm telling you, people who do that have a spirit that is, has bound them. Slavery was not just an event or a thing. Slavery was a spirit. Romans 8, 15, 
Maybe you never got it today. Read it. Romans 8, 15 talks about the spirit of slavery that made people afraid. That spirit that makes people afraid is still working today when somebody sees oppression, sees racism at work, and they have the power to stop it because of fear, fear for their position, fear that they might be rejected by their kind or whatever to protect themselves. They don't defend the one who is being oppressed. And so the evil continues. Evil continues on earth because good men do nothing about it. But you can still call yourself good if, in fact, you see evil and you have power to stop it and you don't stop it. It's a sin unto you. Do you now get it? You get the theology now. So, even if you have not sinned after the sin of Adam, you have sinned your own sin also. And some of it is just because you did not do the right thing. You didn't do anything wrong. No, no, no. You're not like KKK people, white supremacists, or whatever. You didn't do anything wrong. But you just watched it continue. See? And that's why evil goes on. It's not only America. It's all over the world. You know, there are people, leaders, African leaders. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm from heaven, but I came through Africa. And there are leaders who oppress people. They take bribes. They are corrupt to the core. Corruption is not only in Africa. It's in America. You know, it's on Capitol Hill. It's all over the world because it's a human thing. It's a sinful thing, you know. And it's actually basically because sa people are allowing Satan to take over their life. But God has set us free from the spirit of slavery, Romans 8, 15, and has adopted us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus. We are children of God. Amen. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, so don't be afraid of anybody. He's given you a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. This God is real, it's true, and his word is true. And if we begin to live by it, freedom will come to us. Amen. All right, let's continue. Isaiah 14. I hope you're learning something. So, Isaiah 14. It's exciting, isn't it? Verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? We've established that. Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall from heaven as lightning. That's the reference here in Isaiah 14, verse 12. How are you falling from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground? So he was cut down, cast down, thrown down, which did weaken the nations. Next week we'll talk some more about the nations and the cities and those things. I'm telling you, there's so much more in the Bible that we have not delved into. And next week we we'll talk about it. It's here in the Bible, so we must ask, might as well ask ourselves why. You know, it helps us understand some things. Okay, we go on. Verse 13. Isaiah 14, verse 13. For you said in your heart, everybody, please, let's take time. Let's, let's look at this. So Lucifer says in his heart, and I want you to notice five things that Lucifer says. Five things. How many? Five. He says, I will. So he's using his will, his choice. Your will is your choice, right? So his own volition of his own choice. God didn't make him come against God only for God to throw him out. No, he freely, willingly, chose to do these five things and he said them in his heart one i will ascend into heaven two i will exalt my throne above the stars of god the stars of god here refers to the angels but let's continue three i will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Five, I will be like the most high. Do you see this? Five. So he said five things in his heart. This is Lucifer. 
For those who didn't join us last week, please, please study this. The same verses we're looking at here in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to, verse, or to 17. These same verses talk about the devil in Ezekiel chapter 28. You're going to have to read that on your own. We studied that last week. Ezekiel 28, also verses 12 to 17. All right, so here in Isaiah, well, in Ezekiel, you see that Satan got into uh, sin because, uh, he, because of his own beauty. He began to adore himself, you know, I mean, uh, just look to himself and because of his beauty, he got into pride. Ezekiel 28, 12 to 17 teaches us that. We covered that in great detail last week. Now, Isaiah 14. So there are five things Lucifer said in his heart. Let's look at them again, verse 13 and 14. He said, I will ascend into heaven. We'll talk about some of these things a lot more next week. But let me, let me at least just um, suggest them. Point them out so you can have a week to study them before, we, before I teach. He said, I will ascend into heaven. If he said, I will ascend into heaven, then the, when he was saying that, he was not in heaven. He was somewhere below heaven because you cannot ascend above wherever you are, right? He said, I'll ascend to heaven. So he had to have been somewhere below heaven. Do you get it? I'm not trying to make anything. You can study this on your own. But there's enough here to teach us that there's something uh, that was happening, right? Then two, he says, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So he had a throne. Do you see this? He had a throne. Colossians 1, that's a second scripture that tells you that there were thrones. Colossians 1. Okay, we go on. Then number three, he says, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sights of the north. So now this gives us a location. Wherever he wanted to go, we have two names for that place. It was the mount of the congregation. So there, it was mountainous. There was a mountain. It's a high place where there was a congregation of stars of God or angels of God. Do you see this? All It's all there. And it's in the sights of the north. So you have a location given to you. It is in the sights of the north. Some of you already know this. Mount Zion is in the sights of the north, the city of the great king. So he was referring to going to heaven to dethrone God. This is where coups started, you know. This is an insurrection right there. Okay. Then he says in verse 14, I will ascend. Second time we see ascension. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. So that suggests that when Satan was speaking this, he was below the clouds. Do you see it? He was somewhere below the clouds. Ah, fascinating stuff. Then, oh, finally, now the fifth one, he says, I will be like the most high. So now he says, I'm not happy being an angel, an archangel, just, you know, doing whatever I was called to do. Now I want to be the big man. I want to be the big boss. We learned this last week that we should give the devil no place 
but also we should resist him immediately because the moment God saw iniquity in his heart, God cast him out. You don't waste time with the devil. You know, don't cuddle the devil. Don't play around with the devil. Cast him out. Amen. Cast him out. Praise God. If fear begins to come, cast the spirit of fear out. If the spirit of slavery is coming back on you, cast it out in Jesus' name. Amen. You get it? All right. Okay. So, now I'll teach you one more thing, though. Notice that Satan said five I wills. I will do this. I will do that. I will do that. I will do that. I will do that. Five of them. Let's see God's response. I saw this and I was so excited. I was like, wow, this is cool stuff. Look at God. God also said five things he was going to do to the devil. All right. So Isaiah 14. Let's see God's response to the devil from verse 15. So God says to Satan, Yet you shall be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So we can start counting. That God says to the devil, I'm going to throw you into hell. That's one. Verse 2, I mean, verse 16, excuse me. Isaiah 14, verse 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying is this the man that made the earth to tremble that did shake kingdoms please don't let the the use of the word man here bother you angels are called men in the bible they're not human like us but they have appeared like humans. And so when somebody has seen an angel that looks human, they make the mistake of calling it a man. Do you get it? Okay. Daniel did this. Daniel, uh, in the book of Daniel, Daniel called Gabriel a man. This is all in the Bible. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 10. Daniel called Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, a man. He said, I saw a man. And then that man was caused to, to fly swiftly to me. And when he came, he said he was Gabriel. <laughs> oh, wow. So Gabriel, when Gabriel appeared to Daniel, Gabriel looked like a man, like you and me. You know, the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, says some have entertained angels unawares. Now, how do you entertain an angel not knowing that, that it's an angel? It's because that angel looked like, like a human being. Because, man, if anything appears to me with wings, like six wings or two wings, dazzling white, I mean, just all this radiant light around. I mean, I know that's not a human being. But if you look just like me, I know it's human. You, you get it? Okay, cool. So we go on. Isaiah 14. Now God says, I'll throw you down to hell, and I'll also cause people to gaze on you or I'll make you a spectacle. You know, I'll just throw you down and let them see you as nothing. This, this scripture has always personally fascinated me. I'm, I'm like, man, we better use our authority against the devil right now. You don't want to wait at the end of time and then you look down at the devil and say, what? Is that that nothing, that tiny thing that messed up my life? No, you got to know right now that you have authority through Jesus Christ over the devil. Amen. And resist the devil in Jesus' name, you flee from you. Catch this, catch this. Do you remember when Jesus gave authority to 70 of his disciples in Luke 10? And they went out and healed the sick and did all these wonderful things. You remember they came back to Jesus in Luke 10, 17 and said, Master, Master, even the demons were subject to us in, that, in, on, in your name. They were, they were astounded. They were, they were surprised. They're like, they said, even demons were subject to us in your name, right? Thank God, at least they experienced it. They got to see it to their own amazement, but they began to walk in the authority. Amen. Don't wait till 
don't suffer you know at the hands of the devil and then at the end of the time at the end of time satan is just cast down and you are in heaven and you happen to take a look and you say what is that that nothing that i allowed to deceive me don't be deceived so we see god says to satan i will throw you down to hell i'll make you a spectacle before people let's go on isaiah 14 verse 16 they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee i even like the way he uses the word narrowly you know like you look at it, the person sideways <laughs> I tell you, God has such a sense of humor. It's just awesome. And he could have just said, they that see you will look at you. He says they'll look, they will narrowly look at you, look upon you. I, don't you love this? You got to get this. God is saying the devil is nothing. The devil has been defeated. Don't give him power. Sometimes, you know, I travel to some place, you know, another country or in some place, and when you listen to people talk about the power that the devil has, it bothers me because it makes the believers fearful. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus defeated the devil. And the devil himself knows that he has lost his place. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8, study that later, says, If the demons had known that in crucifying Jesus, you and I would be free, they would not have done it. We are free, and the devil knows that. Amen. Know it for yourself and shout it out for others to know. Praise God. All right. So God says, They that see thee shall never look upon thee. That's verse 16 of Isaiah 14. And consider these saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble? That did shake kingdoms like he's nothing. How we let him deceive us. Verse 17. That made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. That opened not the house of his prisoners. Let's read verse 18 as well. All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory. Everyone in his own house. Verse 19. But you are cast out. You are cast out of your grave like an abominable branch. And as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit as a carcass trodden underfoot. Isaiah 14, 20, Thou shalt not be joined with them. So you be alone by yourself. And I always like this. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. Let him go there. Don't you go there. Amen. Check that out again. I've studied, I've taught this before. Matthew 25, verse 41. Let me repeat, please. Matthew 25, verse 41 says, Hell was made for the devil and his angels. So let him go. Hell was not made for people. So don't go there. You receive Jesus, so you come to heaven. Amen. And let's bring others to Christ. You get this? Okay. Now, uh, this is Isaiah 14, verse 20. Thou shalt not be joined with them, so you be alone, because you have destroyed your land, slain your people. The, the, the seed of evil doers shall never be renowned. So it's not good to do evil, because it will not bring you honor. All right, so let's count the five things that God told Lucifer. We find here in Isaiah 14. I actually read all the way to verse 20. I read from verse 12 to verse 20. But let's count the five things. So God told Lucifer, you'll be thrown into hell. 
That was verse 15. In verse 16, he said, I'll make you a spectacle. People will just gaze upon you. Look at you sideways. <laughs> and that was verse 16. And they will talk about you, in, you know, scornfully, uh, they'll, in mockery. You get it? They'll be like, is that that thing, you know? So they talk about you scornfully and, and uh, in mockery. So that's number three, right? You'll be cast to hell. You'll be gazed upon as a spectacle. And you'll be mocked and scorned. And he says, I'll cast you out of your grave like a carcass. We saw that also. You know, that was uh, verse 19. And then we saw in verse 20, you'll be alone. You'll not be joined to others. You'll be alone. Amen. So, God clearly tells us here that Satan failed and he will always fail. That's what I, I see in Isaiah 14. He started his insurrection, he was cast out. And look at all the other things that God said about him. You know, I'll make sure that I depopulate hell and I'll populate heaven. All the people that you, Satan, are taking to hell, I will bring my son Jesus. He's going to die for their sins. And he's going to raise up his body, the church. It's going to give them the keys of the kingdom. They're going to bind your works. They're going to release my power. And I'll set people free. They're going to go into the whole world and preach the gospel of God's love. God's kindness. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. I have come to Christ. Satan has lost me. Satan has lost you. Satan has lost people from all over the world. And tonight you have seen that God's goal actually was to make the devil so lonely in hell. He's got to go there all by himself and take nobody with him. Let this be your goal. Amen. Look at what God did through the Apostle Paul. Paul all by himself. I mean, that's just awesome. Established churches in Corinth. He went to Rome. Gal 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 churches in Galatia, the regions of Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, you know, Thessalonica. Sometimes he was beaten. And then you just go back and preach. You throw him in jail and he's writing scriptures. And he wrote, you know, uh, more than half of the New Testament. That's just awesome. Look at the freedom that we have had. Satan has lost. I'm telling you, the devil is losing ground. Amen. Let's be emboldened, believers, and encouraged to reach out and share the gospel of Jesus. Amen. My time is almost up. i got to show you this scripture before we go. And then I promise we'll continue next week. Let's go to Revelation 12. This is uh, sort of just establishes for us another place where we see Satan losing his place. Revelation 12 from verse 7. Revelation 12 verse 7. It says, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So Michael has his angels, the dragon also has his contingent of angels. Verse 8, and prevailed not, neither was their what? Place, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So Satan has lost his place. That's why He's trying to take your place. So give him no place. You got it tonight? Praise the Lord. I suggest this to you, and we'll study it next week. 
Satan came into the Garden of Eden and tried to take Adam's place. Because he felt it was his. But God had given it to Adam and to Adam's race. And Satan is still trying to take what he thinks or feels is his. And God says, don't give the devil any place. Did you get it? It says here, their place was found no more in heaven. Verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil. He's also called Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, just one more scripture before you go. Just to show you that they had a place, but they don't have that place anymore. Turn to Jude. Jude is only one chapter. We're right there. It's just before Revelation. Jude chapter 1. One chapter, verse 9. Jude, verse 9. He says, Yet Michael, the archangel, so Michael is an archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Okay, this is the part. But there's a better scripture that actually talks about their place. Go to verse 6. Verse 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own place, left their own habitation or their own place, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So, at least three times in the Bible, we have seen the devil had a place. The devil and his angels had a place. In Jude, verse 6, the angels did not keep their place. They lost it. In Isaiah 14, Satan lost his place. In Luke 10, 18, Jesus said Satan was thrown out of heaven. So the devil is trying to take a place that is not his. God gave the Garden of Eden to man. Told Adam, guard it, keep it. Because Satan would, an enemy would try to come and take it. So Satan is always trying to take a place that's not his. May you keep all that God has given to you in Jesus' name. May you not lose anything that God has blessed you with. Hallelujah. May you keep your garden. May you hold on to what the Lord has given you so that no one will steal your crown or take it away from you. In the name of Jesus. Finally, Jesus said, occupy till I come. You see it? Occupy till I come. Take charge. Possess your possessions. I pray this blessing upon you. For the time has come for the sons of God to possess their possessions. So may you possess your possessions. May you recover all. The Lord help you, you and all yours. In Jesus' name, by the faith of God, I call it done. God bless you. God bless you. Occupy your place. For the gifts and talents that I spoke about to help you do your work in your paradise, may you Discover your purpose. Discover your destiny. And occupy that place. May you fit that place. May God set you in place. For he has said, he has set some in the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, administrations. May you discover your purpose. And may you be set in place. And be so comfortable. Because you have finally found your place. God bless you. Receive it. Receive this blessing. You have it. 
I speak this as a man of God, as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, into you, into your house, into your career, into your life. An apostle helps people discover their callings, their purpose, and helps establish them. I pray this prayer over you, that you find your place in the kingdom. You fulfill your purpose and destiny in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. I feel, I feel that God has done some wonderful things. Amen. 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 You can go if you have to go. We're done. Amen. I'm done with the teaching, so we can end right now. But I just want to pray for you. I want to pray with you. Uh, because God has said some things tonight. Uh, in paradise, Adam was supposed to work. I pray that you find your paradise. We're supposed to work to help people. May God lead you into your paradise in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that you discover your calling, your giftings, your purpose, and I pray that there would be a divine connection, that God will connect you to your way maker, God will connect you to the person who will help you be unleashed into your destiny. Just as Jesus was connected to John the Baptist, and John the Baptist baptized him, and Jesus was manifested to Israel as the Son of God, and he began his ministry. I pray for you in Jesus' name that God will connect you to your way maker in the name of Jesus, that you discover your purpose and find your place and fit in your place in the name of Jesus. What God has given to you, may you keep. Keep your family intact. Keep your health. Keep your peace in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Those who joined us on the phone line, those who joined us uh, on Facebook, God bless you. Dr. Nada, God bless you. Uh, JJ Southern Bell, God bless you. I see you. Emmanuel, God bless you. In the name of Jesus, hope, God bless you. Yes, receive the power. Receive the anointing. God bring you into your paradise. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus for our Florida Assembly. God bless you. I see you. Praise the Lord. May the Lord bring you into your paradise. In Jesus' name. May the Lord open your, your understanding the eyes of your spirit, so that you may know your calling and the hope of it. May you find that calling in the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray for you. I see you, Friska. I pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Receive the anointing and discover your purpose and fulfill in Jesus' name. And I pray for all of you, those who have not mentioned, I've not seen your name yet, but you are here listening to me. I pray for you that you find your place. Keep that place in Jesus' name. I declare that the devil will not steal from you. Emmanuel, the devil will not steal from you. Hope the devil will not steal from you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Those who tune in from Georgia and tune in from California, I pray for you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Receive divine breakthroughs today. In Jesus' name. And again, as the Lord said to David, you recover all. May you also recover in Jesus' name. In Psalm 69, the Lord said he restored what he didn't take away. So what Satan stole from you, I pray that the Lord, who did not take it away, will restore to you. Receive it, hope, in Jesus' name. Receive it, every one of you, Florida, Georgia, California. Receive it in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, receive it. Receive it, Miss Abrampa, receive it. Mrs. Kujo in Florida, receive it in the name of Jesus. The blessing of the Lord be upon you today in Jesus' name. I command the enemy to take his hands off of your life, off of your blessings and your family. In Jesus' name, I declare him dislodged, cast out, removed from any place he has taken from your life. In Jesus' name, by the faith of God, I call it down. Lord, we thank you. We magnify you. We glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God richly bless you and keep you all. Praise God. Amen. Share this. 
Tell somebody next week we'll continue. All right? God bless you.